Good morning. How's everybody doing? All right, let's, uh, let's stand and give thanks to the Lord for our God and King. Sing that again. 
nothing has the power to save but your name. Jesus, in your name we pray. Come and fill our hearts today. Lord, bless you guys. Before you sit down, turn around and say hi to somebody you haven't met before or people you haven't met before. Good morning, everyone. Glad to be here, and it's a good morning. We're, this actually, this morning is our Children's Ministry uh, Appreciation Sunday to celebrate and appreciate um, all the teachers and assistants that serve our kids. Um, just want to personally, um, just from a parent's perspective, Pastor Ron's going to be share and pray for you all uh, just a little later. But we are just so thankful for you to teach our kids, to serve them, to be in there week after week and to care for them. And we just want to say thank you uh, just for all you do. Appreciate that. And just a little later, we're going to love just to pray for you, lay hands on you, and just be, be an encouragement to you. For those of you who are uh, new or visiting, we just want to thank you as well for coming and being with us. So we just pray you'd hear from God's word and you'd be encouraged uh, just by the fellowship of his people. And uh, just welcome, welcome to South Hill Calvary Chapel. In your uh, bulletins, you'll see your info sheets. There's a number of uh, uh, just items there, check boxes and so on about our mailing list, about prayer requests and so on. So if you could fill those out, especially if you're new and visiting, we'd love to get to contact with you and just to get to know you. Uh, that would be appreciated. So those are in your bulletins. Today we have like three meetings all at the same time right after this service, so just a quick reminders about those. The first one is the Bible drill, and for you, uh, it's for the children who are going into third grade or those who are in third through fifth grade. This is an awesome opportunity for kids in that age group to learn the Bible. And again, I'm going to put this on a personal note. Uh, our, daughter, our daughter Anna went through it the, for the first time last year, and I was just really, really impressed by how many, how many scriptures she memorized how she can look in her Bible and find out where the books are just real quickly, and it's a, it's a great blessing. So if you have a child in that age group, parents, I'd encourage you at 115 to come to a meeting. It's either going to be here if there's a lot of people or in the overflow room in the back. It's going to be right here. Pastor Allen says right here. So at 115 for the Bible drill. Also, we have an open hands meeting, and that one is uh, just for those uh, get gathered together to uh, talk about the meal we're going to be preparing for those who are in need or homeless at the armory, and that will be up in the upper room at 1.15 p.m. And the last one is a Mission Mexico meeting, and that one you're actually going to have to see Pastor Charles, because I'm not sure where that one's going to be, because we thought they were both going to be up there. <laughs> so talk to Pastor Charles, and you guys can work that out. Our next announcement is men at work. We had a great, um, we had a great breakfast yesterday with the men, 
And during this summer, we, we changed up a bit, and we want to be able to get out into the community, leave the four walls here and get out and serve those who are in need, both maybe folks in our church who are in need, a single mom, someone who's sick, or just uh, someone in the, in the church just needs some help they can't do themselves. We love to go out and serve in that way. Or uh, those who, maybe a friend or a relative that is in need as well, and we can go out and just minister um, Jesus to them share about the Lord with them, help them, uh, and serve that way. So there's the flyer in your bulletin, only one this time. You see it there, it's called Men at Work. And what we need from you, please, is if you'd fill out the back of this, and if you know of those needs, that you'd fill them out and turn them into us, and then we can get in contact with yourself and the people so we can uh, set up a time to go out and uh, serve. And that will actually be on June 8th. It's a Saturday, our next men's breakfast. And our last announcement is a little bit of a change. The missions dinner uh, was going to be scheduled for June, but as you know, uh, our kitchen is no longer there, so that made it a little bit hard to make the admissions dinner. In addition, uh, the Mission Mexico trip was overlapping, or uh, one of the trips was, so we're going to push that to August. So what does that mean? That gives you more time to uh, think of creative ways to have the silent auction. You might give donations and uh, support our missionaries. It's always a, a great time to do that uh, for the missions. So that's now going to be August 18th, 4 to 7 here. Tickets go on sale at the end of July. To wrap up, remember our cell phones to silence those, and there's a couple of rows in the back if you need the, to leave the sanctuary during the teaching of God's Word. And lastly, remember always uh, there's people down here to pray for you uh, at the end of service. And in the back, we have um, elders there that would love to pray for you, anoint you with oil, as uh, it says in James, for the healing, the saving of the sick. We love to pray for you in that way. So let's go to the Lord in prayer now, and then we'll uh, start and worship, and then the Word. Lord, thank you that we uh, get to be here together once again. We pray today that you would reign in this place, that you would teach us of yourself, that we um, personally, and more importantly as, our, as the church, would grow um, in our relationship with you, would learn of you, would be discipled to be closer to what you want to make us as a church. Uh, bless your people this morning, Lord. Fill um, the time with your spirit um, and teach us and, and just help us to worship you. Just give ourselves of you, We're not holding anything back. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, you endured my pain. Savior, you bore all my shame, all because of your love, all because of your love. Maker of the universe, broken for the sin. Of the earth, all because of your love, all because of your love, because of your cross, my debt is paid, because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life I freely give because of your love, because of your love I live. Innocent and holy King, you died to set it's free all because of your love all because of your love Lord you gave your life for me so I will give my life for you all because of your love 
debt is paid because of your blood my sins are washed away now all of my life i freely give because of your love because of your love your victory Jesus you are enough you did it for me you did it for love it's your victory Jesus you are enough because of your cross my debt is paid because of your blood my sins are washed away now all of my life i freely give because of your love because of your love i live because of your love because of your love, I live. Your love is deeper than any ocean higher than the heavens reaches beyond the stars in the Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, Lord of heaven, who I do not Jesus, your love has no bounds. 
Jesus, your love has no bound. Jesus, your love has no bound. Oh Lord, we thank you for that truth that your love has no bounds. <clears throat> that, Lord, we are able to love boundlessly because of the boundless love you have for us. How grateful we are for that, Lord. We praise you for that, Lord, and it is good to be in this place because of that glorious truth and that glorious reason. Be glorified now, Lord, in our um, time of prayer, and worship, and preparation for the study of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> amen. Well, good morning to you all for another 20 minutes, and <clears throat> I always think that the whole morning is morning, but it's not. This second service, we've only got uh, at once at noon, we hit afternoon, so <clears throat> it is good to see everybody. And today, as uh, Pastor Phil noted, it is a special day. It's a day when we have the opportunity to appreciate our children's ministers and our teachers and our assistants. And I tell you, I think that it is one of the areas of service in our church that it can be very easy for us to take for granted and uh, I don't want us to do that as a church. We are so grateful for you. In fact, everyone who is currently teaching, who is assisting, or who is planning on getting into it for the summer, <clears throat> if you would stand up right where you are and remain standing, I would appreciate that. Just right where you are, stand, and let's appreciate them. <clears throat> Amen. I want you to remain standing. We don't have anybody on this side. Did the usher say, if you're not a teacher, you need to sit <clears throat> over there? Because we don't shun people like that by any means. It is so, uh, we're so grateful for what you do to serve our children. And we don't take it lightly. And I want you to know, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to do this. Uh, I realize that I'm not the children's ministry director, but I want you to hear from me that uh, I'm able to do uh, what it is that I do to instruct and the parents in the ways of the Lord uh, teach the word because of your faithfulness to serve in the children's ministry. Uh, we know from the scriptures that uh, the Lord has a very special place in his heart for children, and uh, I believe that he has a very special place in his heart for you because your faithful commitment to minister to our children. So we want to take a few minutes and, and pray uh, with you. Tammy's was here for, she's a teacher as well, and I thought about having her sit down so that it would make that difference. But we're going to pray. Uh, I want you to just go ahead and <clears throat> get up out of your seats and go to somebody who's standing, and we're going to just take a few minutes. <clears throat> that includes this section over here. You can do that. It's okay to cross the aisle. <laughs> And then we're going to take just a few minutes and just lay hands on these teachers and just pray however, uh, out loud, however the Lord <clears throat> would have you pray for them. And then uh, I'll, I'll uh, bring us to group prayer, prayer here in just a few minutes. <clears throat>
Father God, we do thank you for these dear brothers and sisters and their faithfulness <clears throat> in serving uh, you by serving our children. We ask, Lord God, that you would just wrap your loving arms around them and that you would, <clears throat> by the Holy Spirit, just uh, remind them of how much you love and appreciate them and how uh, pleased you are in their faithful service to the children here at South Hill Calvary Chapel, Lord God. We love them, we do appreciate them, and we entrust them into your care, Lord God. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. <clears throat> amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Way to represent this section over here. Where you got up, you went over, you got the job done. Way to go. <clears throat> Want to let you teachers know, too, that as you leave, the ushers have a special candy bar with a special label for you. Uh, this looks like a pretty... Uh, upstanding group, but I, I had to throw out at the first group just for those of you who may be tempted to grab one of those candy bars uh, and you're not a teacher, uh, I personally wouldn't want to do that in the house of God, but <clears throat> I'm going to leave that up to you if you feel so bold as to want to do that. Uh, hey, have at it and just remember Ananias and Sapphira. Anyway, <clears throat> we, do appreciate, uh, we do appreciate you. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the Lord now in prayer and just pray for the various needs represented in our church body. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you so much for your faithfulness and for uh, your goodness. And we're, we're very, very grateful for the church body that you have brought together here, Lord God. We pray for those who are looking for work. We pray for those who are suffering from ill health, Lord, especially. Uh, we pray for Lauren Don Bartosowski's daughter, Lord, who just gave birth, Lord, and is just having some complications. We ask, Lord, that you would sovereignly intervene and that you would use <clears throat> that healing, Lord God, to draw Lauren uh, close to yourself, O oh Lord. We pray for the other uh, sisters who are with child, Lord God. We pray that you'd give them a full-term pregnancy and a healthy delivery. <clears throat> we especially, Lord God, want to pray your comforting hand upon those who are, are just waiting patiently to have children of their own, Lord God. Just help them to not lose hope and to just cling to you, trusting and believing that you are able. Lord, we pray for all of the families <clears throat> in the church who will be hosting orphans from the Ukraine this summer. Uh, we ask, Lord God, that you would just uh, make all of the preparations, provide all of the finances and, and all of the arrangements that they would come together. Lord God, thank you for this opportunity you're giving us to be able to do that, Lord. We pray for those who are faithfully serving in our military. We thank you so much for them, Lord God. We want to pray for... Our, our nation, Lord God. We want to pray for the nation of Israel. And we pray for all of our missionaries, <clears throat> Lord. We're so very grateful for them, Lord God. And we ask that you would watch over them, that you would protect them, especially those who are serving in harm's way, and that you would draw them, Lord God, to uh, a place of just knowing your will and your plan for them. Just help us to continue to grow as we seek to understand how to be uh, a, a globally missions-minded church, O oh Lord. We're going to pray for Veritas Christian Fellowship in their second Sunday service um, today, Lord God, and ask that you would just bless that team, O oh Lord. And we also, Lord, want to pray for our children's ministry today and our junior high ministry, Lord God. Just work through the junior high team, Lord God, as they're just serving such a critical need for that, uh, that age group that can be very confusing for junior hires uh, at times, O oh Lord. I thank you for this facility, Lord. We're so grateful for it. We ask that you would give us, uh, continue to give us favor with the school administration here, and we're so very grateful for providing it for us. Thank you for the finances that you provide for us as well, and we want to continue, uh, Lord God, in our worship, um, in our attitude of giving, Lord God. We're just grateful for the opportunity to worship you through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. We acknowledge that uh, you don't demand that <clears throat> money from us and that you don't need it, Lord God, but you desire that when we give, that we would give cheerfully, abundantly, and, and graciously, Lord God. Teach us how to do that and teach us how to incorporate that, Lord, uh, into our worship, lest we think it's about writing a check, Lord. It's, it's not about that. It's about uh, giving a portion of what you have so richly blessed us with uh, back to you for your work. And we pray that you would give us wisdom as a church leadership, that we would know uh, how, Lord God, to uh, invest those resources in the furthering of your kingdom. 
And we pray these things, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You stood before creation. It spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before my failure, you carried the cross for my shame, and sin weighed up.
that's what we want to do this morning, Lord. <clears throat> we want to offer this heart of ours completely to you. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. You may be seated. Let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 21. <clears throat> Mark 1, verse 21. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand. One of the ushers will be sure to get one uh, to you. And uh, just a reminder that as we look at different verses, I'm going to have you turn to three or four different verses uh, today, uh, this morning. And as we do that, if you see somebody just struggling a little bit because maybe they're not that familiar, would you help them find it so that they don't have to sit there in Leviticus and <clears throat> act like they um, are in John or whatever? How many of you have done that? I've done that before. It's like you just have to do the old fake out and, you know, like here. So we want to help. We want people to be right along with us. And <clears throat> there's nothing, uh, I went years as a Christian and didn't even understand, didn't even know where the books in the Bible were. And, and that's because some churches just don't emphasize learning that sort of thing. So uh, I appreciate what our children's ministry is doing in the area of a Bible drill to, to rectify that. So uh, don't let somebody next to you struggle trying to find it. Help them to find it and don't be so proud that you can't ask for help <clears throat> to do that. We're in the Gospel of Mark. This is our third study. We're in chapter 1, and even though we've just started that, we've only had two studies, um, and we've just started teaching through Mark and a, a series of teachings which I've entitled Living uh, in the Reality of Jesus. I'm having a blast, just a great time, <clears throat> just going through carefully and methodically through these verses very slowly, prayerfully, to consider the spiritual nuggets that the Lord has uh, for us. I love the Word of God, and I love that the Word of God, <clears throat> that the, the words we have on uh, these pages, that they're living, they're active, they're God-breathed, the Bible tells us, sharper than any two-edged sword, and that the words seem to just leap off the paper and cut deep within our souls, judging and speaking to the thoughts and the intents of our hearts, as it says in the book of Hebrews. I, I love that. And in our first study, if you remember, we considered the immediacy of Jesus, and we looked at a number of things that we as Christians are called to do as a result of who Jesus is. We looked at the authority of Jesus. We looked at the fact that he was tempted in every way as we are, except <clears throat> without sin. We looked at his... Uh, how he immediately began to preach the gospel. And then finally, we looked at our call to follow Jesus and the immediacy of that call. And if there was any time that we needed to have an immediacy in our response to the gospel, <clears throat> it is now, amen, as we just see uh, things unraveling in the world all around us. And then if you remember, before... Um, uh, I left for Nashville and Birmingham for those conferences. <clears throat> we took some time to look at the Great Commission and the extreme importance of the commission in a message that I preached entitled Embracing and Fulfilling Our, our, our Commission, Our Call to Preach the Gospel. And if you recall, if you were here from that message, our goal was that we would come away with a deep understanding <clears throat> of our call to embrace and then fulfill the Great Commission. The Great Commission. Uh, our, our Lord's commission to us that we are to what? That we are to preach the gospel to all nations. And then once uh, people have responded, then we're to make disciples of those new converts, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that Jesus commanded. And that's what we're doing here. We're we're making disciples by teaching you the things from God's Word and learning together the things that He commanded. We've been commissioned by Jesus. We've been commissioned by Almighty God Himself to take the gospel into the world, beginning in our own cities and then branching out, branching out from there um, until the world is reached. What is the gospel? I never grow tired of reminding myself what the gospel is. The gospel is the good news of salvation. 
It is the news uh, of the reconciliation of sinful man to a holy and a pure uh, God. And we know, uh, any number of us know, that prior to coming to faith in Jesus Christ, coming to being saved, to being born again, we know that every attempt to try to get reconciled with God by cleaning up our life uh, was a miserable failure. We just couldn't pull it off. Now, I clearly remain that. Uh, that was 35 years ago, but I remember that I just could not be good enough. And Jesus said, hey, if you want to uh, get right with God by your works, then you need to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And thanks be to God. The good news of salvation <clears throat> through faith in Jesus Christ is that it is through him that we're made perfect, by trusting in him. That's the gospel. And it comes through no other way than a heartfelt belief in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And people's hope for receiving that message is through the, the preaching, it's through the proclamation of that truth. As it says in Romans 10, 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? <clears throat> and how shall they preach unless they are sent? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I'm so excited. I'm just so uh, rejuvenated and thankful that the Lord has renewed my heart to this glorious truth. I think it's easy to forget it, uh, for, to forget the simplicity of it in the midst of all the church activity that goes on. Good church activity, not, not bad things. But we must never let the busyness of being the church, let, uh, we must never let those things distract us from our ultimate call, which is to be proclaimers of the gospel. Amen? We mustn't leave the gospel here, but we must be willing to take the gospel to our neighborhoods, to our workplaces, and to all nations. And I don't know about you, but I've been intentional as I've been reading through our Bible reading in a year and reading through the Old Testament and the New Testament, I've been really intentional and just enjoying reading through the scriptures with the Great Commission in mind. And it is everywhere. <clears throat> you see it in every part of scripture. Just this last week, John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus said this. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word, <clears throat> hears my word through the preaching of the gospel and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. You realize that? Pass from death to life. That through faith, we're saved. Through faith, we receive everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. We shall not come into judgment. We will not face judgment because of our faith and our belief in Christ. And in so doing, we have passed <coughs> from death, from condemnation, as you'll hear here in just a little bit, into life. And I pray that you and I and together as a church, <coughs> that that truth would burn deeper and deeper and deeper, hotter and hotter and hotter in our souls with each passing day. Amen? Amen? <coughs> Amen. I cannot tell you how exciting it was to sit at the conference that I was at uh, on uh, the local church and global disciple making, to sit at that conference like a newborn baby at their mother's breast, just taking in the pure milk of the word, as it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, that you may grow thereby. <clears throat> and that's what we have the opportunity to do here on Sundays, is to sit here and to open the word and to take it in and to trust that the Holy Spirit is going to accomplish the purpose that the Word has for us as individuals and then corporately <coughs> together. If you remember from two weeks ago, if you were here, I closed our study with these words. I let you know that I was going to these two conferences, and I said this. I said, I'm going away uh, to these conferences expecting to hear clearly from the Lord nothing new per se, but simply a clear confirmation and definition of what we are all ready to doing and I was so grateful that the Lord had put it upon my heart before I left to preach 
a message on the importance of the Great Commission, the importance of preaching the gospel. And as usual, as the Lord always does, he always will do this. He fulfills that kind of a prayer and expectation. And he did so beyond my wildest imagination. Right off the bat, <clears throat> sitting in that very first study, in the very first session uh, entitled Biblical Basis of Mission, David Platt said this, quote, <clears throat> you can look at it on the screen with me, uh, the command has been compromised. We are tempted as a local church to do everything else <clears throat> except the one thing Jesus told us to do in the Great Commission. Jesus never told us to construct church buildings, organize programs, build schools, colleges, universities, or seminaries. Jesus did tell us to make disciples in every part of the world, end quote. Now, it does not mean that uh, a church building is evil in and of itself. It doesn't mean that the, the programs are bad. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't build schools or colleges or universities or seminaries. But we must never see those as the end, but that those are a means to the end. Because the end is the proclamation of the gospel that people <clears throat> might be saved. And how encouraging it was for me as a pastor to know the back home, as I was being fed, and Pastor Allen and I were being fed, and we were just so excited about what we were hear hearing, that back home we were right on track in, in doing just that, in fulfilling the Great Commission. That's why we're studying through the Gospel of Mark. And we must take to heart and we must take to prayer that we're not studying through the Gospel of Mark <clears throat> so we can just say, oh, that was an interesting story. We're studying through the Gospel of Mark <clears throat> that we might glean from it apply it in our lives, and learn how to live uh, for the gospel, live in the reality of Jesus. And so let's stand together and let's see what the Lord has for us this week as we continue to study this marvelous gospel, learning what it means <clears throat> to live in the reality of Jesus, beginning in verse 21 of Mark chapter 1. Then they went to, into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, <clears throat> for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. And then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us from our text, that we would begin to understand, Lord, not from afar, but that we would understand in a nearness to our own hearts uh, what it is that you wanted uh, by preserving the word, uh, these words, what it is you wanted your church to understand about the demonic realm, O oh Lord. I pray that you would put a hedge of protection around this place, I pray that you would uh, uh, guard our hearts from being distracted from anything that, that you would want us to learn, and that, Lord, you would protect us from being distracted by things the enemy. He hates messages like this. He's not interested in us drawing closer to you. He's interested in us being disinterested in you. And, Lord, if, if we would purpose in our hearts to seek to know what you're wanting to speak to us, Lord God, you're going to transform our lives. And so protect us, Lord, individually and corporately as your church, that we might not only hear what you have for us, but then that we would purpose in our hearts to do what it is you're telling us to do. Oh, Lord, we look forward to what you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As I was reading um, a number of weeks ago, as I was reading through this text, it stood out to me that immediately following 
Jesus preaching the gospel and going into the synagogue and teaching the spiritual truths of salvation through himself as the Messiah, revealing himself as the Messiah, that there was immediately spiritual opposition. And the application to us <clears throat> is that when we decide to get serious about the Lord, there will be spiritual opposition. And with that op op opposition comes the challenge of pressing on in the Lord in the midst of the opposition. And we mustn't think that, well, that spiritual warfare, that spiritual activity takes place outside of these four walls because I want you to pay attention here and note that where did this spirit uh, rear its ugly head? It was in the synagogue. And we know from the scriptures that there are going to be attempts by the enemy to sway some of you even over to his side. There was immediate spiritual opposition, demonic interference, knowing full well that the preaching of the gospel <coughs> leads to the receiving of the gospel, to the believing of the gospel, which in turn leads to the salvation of man by the gospel. And another soul being snatched out of the grips of Satan, snatched right out of the pit of hell. And it's important that we grow in our desire to truly live in the reality of Jesus, that in doing that, we're going to meet opposition. We're going to be, meet opposition. And the more we purpose in our hearts to fulfill the Great Commission, the more that we can expect that the enemy will seek to interfere with that. In, in fact, we must not only accept that as a truth, but we can expect that it is going to happen. <coughs> and so what's happening here is Jesus is teaching with great authority. I love the emphasis in these first verses. I mean, we've been talking about the last two studies, but I love the emphasis on the authority of Jesus. He's teaching with great authority, and he's confronted by the demonic realm, uh, wanting to interfere with the proclamation of the gospel. And we see that with authority, what does he do? He commands the demon to leave. And the demon is compelled to obey. We continue uh, to see Jesus as the one with all authority. And that's first and foremost what we must understand in looking at this whole demonic realm. That Jesus is the one with all authority. Jesus in praying to the Father, John 17, said, You have given me authority over all flesh that I should give eternal life to as many as you have given me. And then he said, just prior to his ascension into heaven and in, in giving the Great Commission, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And I find it interesting that Satan, who is much craftier than you or I, but he's not craftier than Jesus, I find it interesting that when Jesus was just about to begin his public ministry, if you remember, Jesus is being tempted in the desert by Satan. And what is one of the things Satan tries to convince him of? He tries to convince him that he would give him something if he would turn himself over to him, that Satan would give him something that Jesus already had. Satan foolishly said, All this authority I will give to you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. In Luke uh, chapter 4. And we know that uh, Satan comes in and he looks to deceive. And he'll come in and he'll try to convince you that he can give you <coughs> authority. But he cannot give you anything that the Lord himself does not allow. And when we call upon his name and we, we ask him for help in this whole area of the demonic realm, he is always quick and he's always ready to help. And we know from Scripture that ultimately every knee, every single knee will indeed bow at the name of Jesus and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. It says in Philippians chapter 2, those in heaven, those on earth, and those under uh, the earth. And uh, I wish we had a time to really get into that because it's just fascinating when you look at uh, uh, the, the bottomless pit and the, the abyss that's spoken of in scriptures and how uh, the, the pigs don't want to, or how the demons want to go into the pigs rather than into the abyss because they know that what's, what awaits them in the abyss 
is torment and torture and ultimate damnation. Colossians tells us that Jesus is before all things that that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, which is a direct reference to and includes the demonic realm. And I believe the Lord would have us look at this whole issue of the demonic realm, and we're not going to be able to satisfactorily, uh, satisfactorily cover it today alone, so we're going to take today... And then we're going to take next Sunday, and we're going to look at this subject from two perspectives. Number one, today, we're going to look at the reality of the demonic realm. The reality of the demonic realm. And then um, <clears throat> in the next Sunday, we're going to look at our response to the demonic realm. Why in that order? Because our response will never be accurate until we understand the reality of it. And we're going to look at three things today. We're going to look at what Jesus said about the reality of it. We're going to look at what the Apostle Paul said about the reality of it, and then you're going to hear from one of your very own sitting in the sanctuary what they have to say about the demonic realm. And I want to do that this morning so that we can see how real it is. Why? Because it can be very easy to fall into the trap of reading of these events in the Scriptures regarding the demonic realm and then go about our lives as though it was just a story. But there's a reason the Lord captured these things. There's a reason that Paul said the things that he said. There's a reason that Peter said what it is that he said in 1 Peter. These are not just stories. These are real. The demonic realm is more real and evident than ever, and Satan would love for us to think otherwise. Uh, Listen, he can disguise himself as an angel of light, and he is having a heyday in the lives of many people, including many young people today. We must understand that he's very real, and it is clear from the scriptures that he is at the forefront of all of the demonic activity that is taking place today. Jesus makes that very clear in the gospel. Satan hates God and the proclamation of the gospel because it saves people's lives. So, turn with me over to the right, Matthew, Mark, to John chapter 8. You're going to go past Luke, you're going to get to John, John chapter 8, verse 42. I've been praying for you, and we've been praying for you, that you'll really leave today with a real sobering understanding of how real this spiritual warfare that is going on all around us is. This week in our Bible reading, I believe on Tuesday or Wednesday, we're going to be looking at John chapter 8. And we're going to be reading about this conversation that Jesus is having with a number of people, no doubt Pharisees and religious leaders uh, mixed right in there with them. And they're trying to determine the meaning of the things he was speaking. <clears throat> and they insist that they have a right understanding of faith in God. Listen, one of the big challenges of preaching the gospel to the world, especially in the United States today, is people have some real twisted understandings in their thinking about God. And they think that they're right. They think that they're right. And that's because they take the scriptures and they put them aside and they come up with their own idea of what it is. Or they listen to a teacher that will tickle their ears and they don't even come to the point of recognizing that it contradicts what the word of God says. And these were the kinds of people that were coming and they were saying, you know, we're descendants of Abraham and and therefore God is our father through Abraham without any understanding that, that Jesus was the one that God had spoken to Abraham about. And look at verse 42. Jesus says to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and I came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? When we share in the gospel with people, we can ask that question. Why aren't you understanding my my speech? Why aren't you understanding the things I'm sharing from God's word? And Jesus answers that question. Because you're not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. 
uh, recognize that his own resource is just speaking. It's, it's his native language. It's his native tongue. He does not know how to tell the truth. It's impossible for him to tell the truth. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me, Jesus says. Which of you convicts me of sin? <clears throat> and if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? And then pay attention to verse 47. He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Now, those are Jesus' words. And there are a lot of people around us today, even some who would profess to be Christians, who clearly are not of God. Pastor, how can you say, make such a bold statement? Because Jesus said they're not hearing God's word. What does God's word say about Jesus? What does God's word say about eternal life? What does God's word say <clears throat> about heaven and about hell? <clears throat> They're not listening to God's word. And specifically what Jesus said about the reality of the demonic realm led by Satan himself. Years ago when we started the church, I was working a number of uh, part-time accounting uh, jobs and this one nonprofit agency I was working for, uh, the director, very sweet person, had a great heart and really ministering to um, disabled uh, people and especially kids and had a disabled daughter herself. And, <clears throat> and uh, uh, we were having a meeting one time and uh, I, was, I felt like the Lord was opening an opportunity for me to share the gospel with her. And I began to uh, talk generally about the gospel, about God, and then start narrowing it down to the issue of good and evil. And I brought up Satan. And the moment I brought up Satan, <coughs> she said to me, I don't like to do the Satan thing. And it immediately shut down the conversation. And uh, we weren't able to talk anymore because she just said, I don't like to do the Satan thing. And tragically, there are a lot of foolish people who are foolish enough to think that not wanting to do the Satan thing makes the Satan thing go, go away. But it's not true. Because you can bury your head in the sand all you want. You can pre pretend that evil doesn't exist. You can pretend that there, there is no devil, that there is no Satan, contrary to the word of God. But it simply isn't true. Believing that uh, he doesn't exist or not wanting to do the Satan thing does not make him go away. And Jesus, throughout the scripture, he speaks very clearly about Satan and the demonic realm. And we as Christians, Bible-believing, born-again Christians, we must take it seriously. We're going to look uh, uh, at that a little more at the end <coughs> of our study. Turn with me now to Ephesians uh, chapter 6. You're going to go uh, past uh, Romans and then 2 Corinthians and then Galatians and then Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6 <clears throat> verse 12. There's some other verses that surround verse 12 that we'll look at next week. But suffice to say this morning I want to focus on verse 12 because Paul warns the church of Ephesus here in verse 12 and he's warning us as well the reality of the demonic realm. Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Oh, church, we need to understand <coughs> it's not the government that's causing the problems. It's not the people uh, from the Middle East that's coming over here and planting bombs and blowing things up and that sort of thing. It, it, it's not the, the factions that, of, of people and of flesh and blood that are causing the problems. Paul says, listen, that's not what we're wrestling with. We're wrestling with a far more sinister enemy than that. We're wrestling against principalities and powers and, and rulers of the darkness of this age and spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Four factions that Paul speaks of here, which is believed by Bible teachers and scholars <coughs> to be principalities. Principalities referring to demons who have oversight over nations and regions of the world. Powers. Speaking of demons who are waiting to possess humans, keeping people in bondage in any number of ways. Rulers of the darkness of this age or this world. Speaking of demons who are in charge of, of Satan's worldly business, demonic influence of leaders in various societies, past and, and present. Hitler, 
<coughs> Idi Amin, uh, Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, Mamun uh, Ahmadinejad, and, and among others who will continue to rise up. These are the rulers of the darkness of this age. And then, spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. This is speaking of demons. Demons in the heavenlies who have charge of false religions and, and mysticism. Uh, look at this quote by Dr. Merrill F. Unger in, uh, in a commentary I read about biblical uh, demonology. He's an author with Moody Press. Look what he says. He says, Satan holds sway over the fallen spirits who concurred in his primal rebellion. His authority, his authority is without doubt what he has been permitted to retain from his creation. These spirits having made an irrevocable choice to follow Satan instead of remaining loyal to their creator have become irretrievably confirmed in wickedness and irreparably abandoned to delusion. Hence, hence they are in full sympathy with their prince and render him willing service in their varied ranks and positions of service in his highly organized kingdom of evil. And you can see that clearly laid out throughout the scriptures. Make no mistake about it, Satan is not omnipresent as many people think. He's not every, able, he's a created being, a fallen angel. He's not able to be everywhere at the same place as God is. So how does he uh, do his evil biddings? He does it through the billions upon billions of demons that are at his beck and call constantly looking for ways to dispatch them. And that's what we see present here in our text this morning. That's what we see going on as the church is being established in <coughs> the book of Acts. It is very real. We are not to take it lightly. You may remember a quote I read to you a couple of years ago uh, where I heard uh, Warren Smith speak at a pastor's conference. I'll never forget it. He's a Christian author and former New Ager who was sharing how he went to see a psychic at the prompting of a woman he was interested in who he was, he was dating. And he just did it for her because he was interested in dating her. Uh, and I find it interesting that these psychics, we see them all over, but where they're starting to creep into the neighborhoods. I was driving up Shaw Road the other day, and I saw a big banner on the shed over to my right in, behind somebody's, um, on somebody's shed that basically set, was an advertisement for a psychic and for a palm reading. And people have a tendency to think that, that well, that's just innocent fun. It is an innocent fun. Uh, and there's a, the, em, the enemy, again, he wants to disguise himself as, as an angel of light. Uh, don't, don't play around with these things like <coughs> Harry Potter and, and, uh, and Twilight. Hey, they may seem just fine on the surface, although I have a little trouble understanding how uh, vampires falling in love and sucking blood out of people's necks is innocent. I mean, I, I've had those conversations with Christians. Oh, it's just, it's just about romance. Well, is that why they look stark white and have fangs? I mean, I, I, that doesn't strike me as being uh, some of the uh, Walt Disney romantic uh, stories that, I, that I've heard about. And yet we're lulled into thinking that these are all right. But they're a part of the occult. They're a part of sorcery and, and magic and that sort of thing. And Warren Smith says that the psychic began to tell him things about himself that she could not have known as she's doing this reading. Let's look at what <coughs> Warren Smith said. <coughs> he said, I didn't know about divining spirits and I was impressed. And then towards the end of the reading, there was like this whirling sensation over my head. And that was like really weird. I mean, I, I'd never experienced something like this before. Just like, what is going on? And she says to me without my saying anything to her, she says, are you aware that there's a ball of light over your head right now? And I said, I don't know what it is, but I can feel something up there. And she said, it's a ball of light. And I said, what's a ball of light doing there? And she said, you have a lot of help <coughs> on the other side. And I said, the other side. And she said, the spirit realm. Angels, loved ones that have passed on. Spirits that are interested in your well-being. She said, but they need your permission to get involved in your life. 
you know, people, they toy around with, uh, uh, and young people especially, they'll get together and they'll toy around. And, you know, let's try to call up uh, some evil spirits. And some friends have told me about that. Or the Ouija board. I can remember when I was a kid uh, playing with the Ouija board. And, and let me tell you, that is playing with fire. It's playing with fire. And I think, oh, it was so cool. You know, I had, I had this person. Uh, they told me that this person we, I was going to marry or this or that. And that's not to be toyed with. And that's what Warren Smith is talking about here. And ultimately, they're going to ask for some permission from you. Later that night, Warren Smith shared with us at that conference that he did indeed give these spirits permission. And from that point, he rapidly progressed in the whole uh, New Age uh, movement. One more example <coughs> of the reality of the demonic realm. <clears throat> and then we'll conclude. I told you about Jesus. We know what Jesus says about it. I read what Paul said about it. Well, about two and a half years ago, I got a call <clears throat> from a very concerned mother asking if I had any experience with demons. I proceeded to tell her that I had had limited experience in that area, but certainly I had a very clear understanding of what the scriptures had to say and what Jesus had to say about the demonic realm, that it was real, and that a Christian could not be demon-possessed, and that Jesus is the only one who is stronger and mightier than a demon. We'll talk more about uh, uh, possession uh, next week. But then she proceeded to tell me that her son, whom, interestingly enough, I had shared the gospel with a few years early, was pretty certain that he was demon-possessed, and he was very concerned about it <coughs> and what to do. And I told her, I said, well, if he's interested, knowing that from my last interaction with him a few years previously, the last thing he would have wanted to do was meet with me. I told her I would be happy to meet with him and be available in any way uh, I could. Much to my surprise, I believe within the hour or a short time after that, she called me back and said, we'll be there this afternoon. Apparently, he was eager to find out what was going on. And I was surprised by that given the fact that years earlier he thought I was a complete fool for my beliefs and didn't hesitate in one way or another to tell me so. He wanted nothing to do with God, nothing to do with Jesus, nothing to do with the Christian faith, and indirectly he was saying, I want nothing to do with you. And I want to invite that young man, uh, Philip Berquist, whom I'm sure uh, many of you know, he's very involved in our church, has been for <coughs> two and a half years, and he's going to share his testimony of what took place on that day in my office, October 14th, uh, to 2010. Hi. Hi, my name's Phil, and um, for those of you here who don't know me, I've been attending South Hill Calvary for a little over two years. Um, and the reason I'm up here and speaking to you this afternoon is to just to testify to the reality of the things that we've been reading in the Bible this morning and to testify to the reality of the scriptures and the reality of the spiritual world that's all around us and we can't see it. Um, I think it's really easy to read the stories in the Bible as things that happened way back when, but there's no application to our lives now. And you can really especially read the Gospels, and you can read about Jesus casting out demons and uh, healing people and, you know, walking on water and doing all these things. And, but that's something that happened 2,000 years ago. That couldn't happen, you know, in modern times, right? Um, but nothing could be further from the truth. So I'm just going to share with you how I know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, I grew up uh, going to church, my parents are Christians, and they would bring me to church, and they wanted me to get involved and, you know, uh, receive the Lord and all that. And they, so I came in, and I remember when I was really young, I tried to pray one time, and it, a couple times I tried to pray. It didn't, and it didn't do anything for me. It didn't, I didn't get anything out of it. So I just, I put that aside. I said, that's stupid. I'm not, I don't believe that. And I can, I can even remember watching my parents pray and saying, I was thinking to myself, that's, what are they doing? They just, they're talking to themselves. And that's what went through my mind. And so I just, 
I didn't believe, and I always had this desire, though, inside of me that I, I needed something else. I needed something uh, to make me right. And so um, as soon as I could get out of my parents' authority, get out of their house, I knew that I was going to search out for experiences and look for things to fulfill me. And I did that. Even before I was out of their house, I got into drugs and drinking and other things. And um, that continued for, for a while. You know, Jesus, the Lord said that it, he who commits sin is a slave to sin. And that was me. I was a slave to sin. I did everything that my sin wanted to do, that I wanted to do. I wanted to fulfill my own desires. And so throughout college and my young adulthood, I went from thing to thing to thing. The next thing, the next experience, the next high, the next thing that would, I thought would make me happy. But the funny thing is, none of it ever made me happy. It actually made me worse. I, every time I would try to fulfill myself, I would end up more miserable, more anxious, more nervous, hating my life more, waking up and um, just dreading the thought of having to live another day. And so I just continued in this pattern. And because of this really just self-absorbed life and the, that my life was so dark in a lot of areas, I ended up seeking uh, an experience with the demonic realm. And let me assure you that if you seek that, you'll find it. If you pursue demons, they'll, you'll, you'll get them. And I'm not going to describe to you the, all the details, but I ended up becoming possessed by an evil spirit. And I remember it happening. It was, happened at a moment in time. And I re clearly remember what happened. And I was living with my brother at the time in a house in Seattle that we were sharing together. And as soon as it happened, I began to lose my mind. I lost control of my thoughts. I lost control of my speech. I lost control of who I was. I couldn't make thoughts into words. I couldn't have normal conversations. I couldn't control what I was seeing. Imagine losing your mind and knowing you're losing it and knowing that you're never going to get it back. And you did that to yourself. And that's what was going through my head and it was the most frightening thing I've ever experienced. I knew that I was going to die and I knew I was going to hell. Absolutely hell was certainty for me. And... It was, it was frightening, but by the providence of God and by his mercy, I ended up a few days after being possessed in the office of Pastor Ron, and I was sitting there on the couch across from him, and my mom was there, who she brought me, and Mark Jones was there across from me, and she kind of told him the story of my life up to that point, and Ron was, he was trying to talk about the Lord to me, and I, I just said, look, I need God. I need God now. <laughs> I need to see God. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> so he said, okay, Phil. And so he walked over to me, and, and he put his hand on my head, and he prayed over me. And at the end of his prayer, he commanded the evil spirit that was in me to leave in the name of Jesus Christ. And as soon as he said those words, I fell flat on the table in front of me, and the evil spirit that was in me was cast out, and I mean it was cast out. It was violent. It was painful. Praise God. Praise the Lord. And I'll tell you, going from being possessed by a demon to knowing that God is real, and not only is he real, he he had mercy on me. On me. And before I, I step down, I just want to say one thing. Um, since I've been walking with the Lord here, I, I talk to Christians and I tell them my story. And sometimes I hear people say to me, um, 
you know, Phil, wow, that's great. Uh, if only I could have a, a supernatural experience like that. Don't ever say that to me. Okay? If you're a Christian today, you've had a supernatural experience. You've been born again from above. You've been given a new heart, and you're a new person. That's from God. <laughs> so my testimony today is that although I deserve judgment for my sin, I deserve the wrath of God. In his mercy, he came in the flesh in the form of a man to the earth. He walked the earth a perfect life, a sinless man, and although tempted like me. He was hung on the tree where he bore my sin in the flesh, and his blood has cleansed me from all my sin. He was buried, and then he rose again on the third day, and he now lives forever to make intercession for me. For me. Jesus Christ is my God and my Savior, and he's the Lord of all. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And that's my testimony. Amen. That's the second time I heard it, and I was even better the second time. And here's what, as I was listening to it the second time, here's what's so cool. <clears throat> oh, I wish you could have seen what an arrogant little punk he was <laughs> about five, six years ago. When he was, he was mocking God in, as, as I was parting from him. I'd met with him three times, and he was mocking God. And you could just see it in his, and, and his parents had taught him to be respectful. You could just see there was that part of him, but you could see in his smile and in his look and his eye that it was like, you're an idiot. You could just see that that's what he was conveying <clears throat> to me. And I, I wish you could have seen that because especially for some of you who are new here, you're thinking, oh, you know, I've been to a church like that. And the guy gets up and he gives a, you know, fire brimstone testimony and everything. This isn't somebody that got saved two weeks ago that's going to be walking in the flesh next week. We've seen enough of those. This is a brother who uh, I've had the pleasure with meeting with uh, consistently for two and a half years and have watched him pursue relentlessly the heart of God in ways that I've seen few people. Why? Because he's been transformed. Because he's been transformed. Because if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And Mark Jones, <clears throat> the brother that he was telling you about that was there with him, I purposely had him come because the Lord had, he had a similar experience. The Lord had delivered him from drugs and alcohol. And, and I remember uh, he was in the psych ward when I met him in our church uh, because he had just attempted to take his own life. It's real. God transforms lives. Uh, God does powerful things to to transform us and to make us into a new creation. Phil said, uh, I, I, was, I was struck flat on the table in front of me, and the demon that was in me came rushing out of my uh, body. I'll never forget that picture. Mark and, and, and Phil's mom was there with us. Phil slumped over as if he were dead. And I, I just remember just marveling uh, at, at when he, all of a sudden he just picks himself up and he was free. <clears throat> and I couldn't help but think of what we'll get to when we get to Mark chapter 9, when Jesus saw the people running together and he rebuked an unclean spirit. He said, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you to come out of him and enter him no more. And the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he, who had been possessed, became as dead, so that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. And that's the power of Phil's testimony. He was dead, and Jesus took him and lifted him up. What a glorious thing it is that Jesus who is in us is greater than Satan who is in 
the world. Remember the words of the prodigal son's father, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. Brothers and sisters, if you remember anything today, the demonic realm is real, but so is God. And the power of the name of Jesus Christ is more real than ever. Who can deliver us from this body of death, Paul asked. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, he declared. Turn back to Luke chapter 22, verse 31, and we'll close uh, with these two verses. It is a sober reminder of the reality of the demonic realm. You know the setting here, Luke 22, verse 31. <clears throat> it is the eve of Jesus' crucifixion. And Jesus has just finished washing the disciples' feet and sharing the Last Supper with them. He's literally hours from his arrest and his death. And Peter, one of his closest men, his entrusted leaders, the one whom Jesus knows will be a significant leader in the establishment of the church, and Jesus is preparing Peter for the difficult news that before the day is over, Peter will deny Jesus three times, and he can't believe it. <clears throat> we know the story. He can't believe it. He can't believe that that's going to happen. But Jesus, knowing all things, knows that it's going to happen. And here's what he says in Luke 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Peter, Peter, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Make no mistake about it, the demonic realm is very real. We've seen that from the words of Jesus, we've seen that through the words of Paul, and we've heard it through the testimony of one of our very own. And take to heart the fact that Satan is asking for some of you right now. There are meetings going on right now asking for some of you, especially those of you who are wanting to get serious about your faith. But take to heart our Savior's words. He's praying for you. He's praying for you. And the enemy will not have the final say in the, in the matter. And I find it so fascinating and encouraging that it was Peter, it was Peter who after denying Jesus and then being restored by Jesus after his resurrection, prior to his ascension, that he would write two amazing letters, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, and then in 1 Peter 5 he would say this, and he's saying this to us as a church, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. He was humbled. Uh, I would never deny you. In fact, I'm ready to die for you. Jesus said, Satan's asked for you, Peter. And Peter writes, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, he walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Last night, a number of us gathered together <coughs> at the Wilsons with the common bond of committing to hosting 13 kids from five years to 16 years of age <coughs> for six weeks this summer. And let me tell you, we were crying out to the Lord. Those of you know who were there, you know what I'm talking about. We were crying out to the Lord uh, because we, they don't speak any English. Some of them do, but the vast majority speak nada English. Spanish isn't going to help me in that setting. Uh, my wife and I, we were saying, well, let's take Google Translate. Let's hear a little Russian. I think uh, our particular child that we're hosting, 16-year-old uh, Valera, uh, pray for Valera, but pray for us because we were listening, and we started laughing hysterically as we were listening how to say, um, uh, you know, we're glad to have you here in Russian. Oh, my word, the chances of me saying that, I, it's virtually impossible. And so we were huddled there in a group with, 
with Sergio and, and Lacey who've hosted before and I was so grateful they were there and, and I was humbled and we began to cry out to God like little children. <laughs> now Gabe Ledford, he's a pretty tough guy. Was it, it was Apache helicopter, is that right? You flow? Blackhawk. Oh, <laughs> just a Blackhawk. Anyway, <laughs> I saw a picture in his house of that helicopter and my respect for what he did to fly that kind of went up. But like a little baby, he's crying out to God, God, we don't know what to do. Help us, God. And it just waved. The whole wave was, we're just all crying out to God. It was so humbling. Saying, Lord, oh, it's easy to, you know, we'll host the kids. Praise the Lord. Isn't that nice and global? But the reality is they're coming. <laughs> they're coming. And they're excited about it. He says, humble yourselves under the almighty hand of God that he may exalt you, casting all your care upon him. That's what we were doing. We were crying out to him. And man, I'll tell you, when Gabe prayed, my, I was saying in my spirit, amen, 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 brother, because I was feeling the same thing. It's like the fact that I'm a lead pastor at the church. It suddenly didn't mean as much right in that moment. We were crying out to God. Humbled by our inability to handle the task before us yet. And this is what's important. Comforted by the fact that with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Amen. And, and, that we're in it together. That we're in it together. Church, we must at all costs resist Satan recognize that the demonic realm is real, and on all fronts knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world, and thanks be to God, we are in it together. We're in a good place as a church. We're in a good place. And pray throughout this week as you're searching the scriptures. We're going to see next week, uh, we, we don't need to be fearful of the enemy. We need to be respectful of the power the Lord has allowed him to have in these times in which we live. And next week we'll get equipped with how do we respond to that realm. Because you see, the enemy wants to scare us to the point to where we don't do anything. But I'm so fired up about who God is and his power to transform a life, mine, yours, Phil's and others that he's not going to keep me from proclaiming the truth of the gospel that is the only thing that will set people free. We mustn't as a church get complacent in he set us free. Now we can just kick back till he returns. No, he set us free. Why? So we can advance the gospel that others might be set free as well. Amen. I'm so thankful we're in it together. Let's stand and pray together. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you so much for your faithfulness to speak to us from your word. We're thankful, Lord, that perfect love casts out all fear. And in Jesus' name, I pray for every person in this room that maybe prior to this study, has not taken to heart the seriousness of the demonic realm. Maybe you've even dabbled in some things that they ought not to have been. I pray that they would humbly come before you and surrender those things. I pray that those who are thinking that it isn't real, that they would take to heart the words of Phil when he said, if you seek him, you will find him. And while that's true of God, it says, seek me with your whole heart and I will be found by you, it is equally true of the enemy. He is saying, seek me and I will find you. He's the father of lies. It's his native language. And we praise you and we thank you that you who are in us is greater than he that is in the world. And I pray, Lord, for those that may be toying with that, that they would come to their senses and plead and cry out for the love of God, for Jesus to rescue them. 
Lord, you're the one who made the heavens, you shaped the earth, you formed our hearts. You're the one who's holy and worthy, the one due and worthy of all of our praise. Church, let's just sing this together and, and then um, Rick will dismiss us, dismiss us and then we're going to be down here and I would just ask that when you're dismissed, if you just try to leave quietly and give people the opportunity to come forward. Don't leave here if there's something going on in your life that you need prayer for. Remember, what did Peter say? Humble yourself. Don't do what Peter did the first time. Oh, not me, Lord. No, humble yourself. Come forward. Let us pray with you. Let us agree with you that uh, he who is in you and is, is greater than he that is in the world and he who is in this place wants to overcome anything that is oppressing you. Let's sing together. You're the one. You're the one who made who shaped the earth You're the one who formed my heart long before my birth I believe you always lead me All my days have been Your thoughts toward me are holy, full of love and grace. You are the one, you are holy. You are the one, you are worthy. You are the one. the one